Hey friends, this is Dave from Mythic Concepts, and today we begin an exciting series of videos about the mythic concepts of ancient India. And I do mean ancient. We're going to work our way all the way back to the Harappan or Indus Valley Civilization. Although it really should be called the Indus Sarasvati Civilization, since it flourished on both of those great rivers. And we really should give the Sarasvati some respect, even if it's dried up and gone now. Whatever name you call it by, it's very, very old. Having begun its high period around 3000 BC and having developed for centuries and millennia before that. And it's nothing less than the largest unified urban culture of the ancient world. Larger even than Sumer, Akkad, and ancient Egypt combined. Although we're learning more and more all the time, we still know far too little about this ancient civilization, mainly because its script has yet to be translated and also because many of its urban sites have yet to be fully explored or even uncovered. However, a few of the famed Harappan seals, which are much tinier than you'd think, by the way, look at this, do appear to have religious or mythological imagery on them, which means that you are looking at basically the oldest mythic concepts in India for which we have any sort of record. In particular, much has been made of the so-called Pashupati seal, which appears to depict a horned, meditating figure that looks a lot like Shiva, with Shiva, of course, being the deity who is later associated with tantric yoga all throughout Hinduism and Vedic mythology. This potential proto-Shiva is surrounded by animals, as you can see, and that's a characteristic of a form or incarnation of Shiva known as Pashupati, which means Lord of Animals, hence the nickname of the seal. These identifications are, of course, tentative since we haven't translated their script and aren't even totally sure about what language they spoke, although we have a couple of guesses and we'll get to that later. However, for a few months, I've been sitting on a couple of observations that I made about this seal and a few other seals that also depict this horned meditating figure that could potentially add weight to the theory that these seals are depicting a proto-Shiva, and that he should be regarded as sitting in a yogic lotus position. What is that observation? Well, I'll give you the quick version while you're clicking the like and subscribe button, and thanks for checking out the video, by the way. So take a look at the head of the seated figure. You see that little baby tree sprig growing out of the top of the figure's head between the two horns? This tree has been identified by scholars as the Pipal, or Ashvata tree. Even though it's very tiny here, its signature heart-shaped leaves are much easier to recognize on the the larger depictions of it on other seals and on Harappan pottery. That's important because the Pipal or Ashvata is no ordinary tree. It's the cosmic world tree or tree of life of Indian myth. The holy fig, Ficus religiosa, also known by the names Pipal, Ashvata, and Bodhi. Which means, yes, that's the same type of tree that Buddha was thought to have been meditating under to reach enlightenment. And Krishna, too, is associated with meditating beneath the holy fig tree. For some reason, the Ashvata seems to be a very under-discussed world tree in mythology circles. And I really don't know how that happened, both because it's associated with the famed personages of Buddha and Krishna, but because the Ashvata clearly stands out from the forest of cosmic world trees in its own right. What with it growing upside down from, from space. space. That's right, a tree with roots above in the heavens. It's quite the esoteric mystery, which we'll have a lot of fun unpacking. Most importantly, the Pipal tree has been consistently associated with meditation from Vedic times all the way through the present. And that means that finding it on the Harappan seals, specifically in the context of the possibly maybe meditating proto-Shiva, lends significant weight to the hypothesis that these are meant to be depictions of a meditating proto-Shiva seated in yogic lotus posture. The ramifications of that are very significant. It would mean that some of the major building blocks of religious practice and belief of Vedic India, which gave birth to Hinduism as well as Buddhism and Jainism, have their roots in the ancient Indus Valley Civilization. Now that's not exactly some sort of far-fetched ancient aliens type hypothesis, of course. The Indus Civilization was huge and long-lasting, and the Vedic Civilization arose later in the same region of the Indian subcontinent. So the idea of there being some amount of continuity of spiritual thought between the two isn't exactly unexpected. However, the question of the origins of Vedic India, both in terms of its people and its beliefs, 
is somewhat complicated and politically sensitive, to say the least. And even though it's very obvious to look for links between the Indus civilization and Vedic India, that task is, of course, greatly complicated by, again, the fact that we haven't been able to translate the script of the Indus civilization. That makes it very hard for us to come to solid conclusions about what their beliefs were or what they called their gods, assuming they had gods. Thus, any sort of link that we can draw between the two cultures is both significant and very interesting, even if it's still somewhat speculative and very much a hypothesis that needs to be borne out by other lines of research. There's a lot more to it, but that's the quick version. So here's what I have planned for this video series. In this first video, we'll review a brief summary of the latest scientific research into the origins and early evolution of the Indus and Vedic civilizations. This is the historical context that we need to know in order to draw any sort of link between the beliefs of these two cultures. The history here is really fascinating, and although I'll obviously be summarizing a lot, I've included a nice set of research links and further reading in the description below the video, so you can explore that further on your own. The history here can also be a touch controversial, as I mentioned, and and that's why I decided to tackle the subject head on before we start analyzing the Harappan seals for symbolism or discussing the mythology of the Ashvatha tree in Vedic scripture. In the second video, we'll shift our focus to those Harappan seals and the meditating, possibly maybe proto Shiva, and the possibly maybe Ashvatha tree growing out of his head, so that I can fill you in on the rest of what we have to go on in terms of trying to understand how likely it is that these seals are depicting some form of Shiva and yogic meditation in general. In the third video of the series, we'll deepen our understanding of just what it means to potentially identify the Vedic cosmic world tree on the Harappan seals by going on a full exploration of the mythology of the Ashvata, which has occupied a very important place in Southeast Asian culture for some 3,000 years, if not since the times of the Indus civilization. The Ashvata mythology will bring us uniquely Indian versions of many of the classic mythic concepts associated with such cosmic world trees, which, as I mentioned, includes flipping the cosmic tree upside down. As weird as that sounds, it's made very clear in the Vedic scripture that he who can know the mystery of this tree understands the teachings of the Vedas. Admittedly, climbing an upside-down cosmic tree into space does sound a bit abstract and potentially very challenging, but I promise that we can wrap our heads around it. And though we may not be able to claim to fully understand the teachings of the Vedas afterward, we will have gained a better understanding of Hinduism and yogic meditation in general. So buckle up, click the like and subscribe button, and let's talk about Harappans, Indo-Aryans, and the origins of India. I started this channel because I love world mythology, as you might guess, and Though I plan to cover myths from many parts of the world, I find myself starting with Indian myth because it just has some of my favorite concepts and metaphors. It really just speaks to me, and I want to bring some of these concepts to new people if I can. However, when it comes to the origins of Vedic India, it's no secret that there are extremist forces out there who want to politicize the matter in ways that are both historically inaccurate and culturally divisive, to say the least. So the first thing I want to be clear about in terms of how I'm approaching this is that I stand very clearly in favor of scholarship, research, and science, and very strongly against racism, nationalism, and other examples of what I would consider misusing mythology to divide people. When it comes to India, it's simply a fact that there is a several centuries long history of, well, let's just say it, racists and various kinds of race supremacists and ethno-nationalists from European countries misusing the concept of proto-Indo-European dispersal to make some version of the claim that white people built everything. Specifically, the claim here is that ancestral Europeans basically rode into India, conquered the more primitive natives with fire and sword and wheeled chariot, and then wrote the Vedas and gave India its culture. This was originally called the Aryan Invasion Theory, and even without that title, you will find many people throughout recent history, and to this very day, essentially implying some version of this scenario, often with a very ugly political or social agenda behind it, but sometimes just from listening to bad information. The modern scientific consensus on this, supported by essentially all mainstream scholars and founded upon linguistics, genetics, archaeology, comparative mythology, and many other disciplines, and do check out the links in the description of the video, is that there was, in fact, a significant migration of people with steppe ancestry from the area of the Ural Mountains and the Oxus River 
into northwest India in the late 2nd century BCE. Scholars refer to these groups as Indo-Aryans when they arrive on the doorstep of India. Before that, they had splintered off from a group scholars call the Indo-Iranians, or Proto-Indo-Iranians, and those would be the steppe peoples of the Sintashta and the subsequent Andronovo cultures in the Russian and Kazakh steppe north of India. The Sintashta, based at the southern tip of the Ural Mountains, were the first to invent the wheeled chariot, and they actually domesticated the type of horse from which all modern horses descend. That's pretty impressive. In other words, the Sintashta represent a major evolution of the culture of their steppe ancestors, whom they had previously split off or grown out of much further to the west, somewhere in the 2500 to 3000 BCE range, as you can see on this map. Those older steppe peoples are known to scholars as the Corded Ware and Yamnaya, or Yamna, cultures, with the Yamnaya of approximately 4000 BCE having been identified as the group of Proto-Indo-Europeans whose descendants went both west to Europe and east to India and Iran and a few other places. Siberian hunter-gatherers and ancient speakers of Finno-Uralic languages, both of whom lived in a band of forest biome that runs parallel to the Russian steppe to the north, also mixed with the people of the steppe here and there along the way. So in other words, yes, if you go back some five or 6,000 years, there are some very successful, lighter-skinned pastoral nomads on the Pontic steppe north of the Black Sea who passed certain chromosomes onto people in both Great Britain and India, as well as much of their language and culture, of course. Their impact across Eurasia was huge, and much has been written about it. And this Proto-Indo-European dispersal is the framework upon which linguists and cultural anthropologists and mythicists like myself engage in comparisons of Proto-Indo-European descendant cultures. These common Yamnaya ancestors weren't Aryans, though. So far as we know, that word was only used by the Indo-Iranians in the East, who migrated into India and Iran, and never by anyone who stepped foot in Europe. Additionally, the word Aryan or Arya is a description of a cultural group, not an ethnic group. So, even though most Indo-Aryans were genetically similar, people from other cultures with whom the Aryans intermarried with could and did become Arya. And this certainly happened in India, and in the mountains north of India, and out on the steppe as well. Thus, you can see just how factually incoherent it was for Hitler to appropriate the term Arya or Aryan as a catch-all term for the white race, or for the Germanic people. More broadly speaking, it's just as factually incoherent, as well as highly, highly problematic, for any modern-day person outside of Indian or Iranian descent to use the word Aryan to describe themselves. Although some people are actually trying to legitimize this. I suppose it would be slightly less incoherent for modern people of European descent to try to identify with the Yamnaya as their cultural ancestors. But unless they're living that steppe nomad life, you know, raiding cattle and women from their neighboring bands, conducting the sacred horse sacrifice, composing oral poetry without the aid of writing, the entire undertaking seems a bit dubious to me. I mean, think about how silly it would be for someone living today to call themselves a Yamnaya or corded wear person, or to speak of all light-skinned people as the Yamnaya race, who can today claim some sort of coherent cultural identity based on the lifestyle of people on the Pontic Steppe 5,000 years ago. It just doesn't really make sense, does it? Now, as to the Indo-Aryans who did migrate into India, well, there turns out to be many, many things wrong with the invasion theory. And the more complex truth turns out to be quite interesting, albeit less suitable to extremist political agendas. To begin with, there is, as of yet, no evidence of widespread armed conquest. In fact, the urban phase of the Indus civilization had already been in decline for some time when the Indo-Aryans arrived, with most of their urban sites having already been abandoned. For the most part, their population had already shifted from an urban lifestyle, relying heavily on trade and highly centralized, organized farming, to a more rural lifestyle, focused still on agriculture but also on pastoralism. And they had already spread out from their cities into small towns towns and into the countryside, and also to the east and especially to the south of the Indus civilization proper, where they then mingled with other native Indian peoples. So, rather than an armed conquest, the evidence instead points to a gradual process of migration, cohabitation, assimilation, 
and intermarriage, which would have combined the culture of the incoming nomadic peoples from the steppe land to the north with that of several indigenous cultures, both in northern India as well as the mountains of Central Asia right outside India. By the time the Vedas were composed, and definitely by the time they were set to writing, this process of assimilation was already well underway, leaving us with the mystery that I want to begin addressing with these videos. The question of what parts of Vedic culture and myth were brought in by the Indo-Aryans, which we know a lot about, and what parts already existed in India, which we know less about. Not for the sake of fighting over who owns a mythical deity or belief set, of course, which I would again argue is both divisive and nonsensical, but because the Indus civilization was so advanced, widespread, and long-lasting, and too little is known about its influence on later Indian culture due to its untranslated script. I also tend to think that, in general, a little too much emphasis might be placed on the Proto-Indo-European migrants as opposed to the cultures that they assimilated with. Now, don't get me wrong, the Proto-Indo-European migrants definitely wielded huge cultural influence wherever they went, and again, much has been written about that. However, they were also quite malleable to the language, customs, culture, and beliefs of the people that they assimilated with. As a result, the various PIE descendant cultures are mostly very different, despite sharing similar versions of many words and mythical stories, and those differences mostly come from the native cultures that the steppe nomads merged with in various places. It's also important to remember that the PIE steppe peoples were preliterate, meaning that they lacked writing. Instead, they preserved their ideas through a very strict oral tradition, which is a very impressive feat in its own right, of course. Thus, it wasn't until a wandering Proto-Indo-European culture assimilated with a literate culture somewhere that any of their ideas were written down. And every time this happened, the language and culture of the literate society would, of course, exert a strong influence. This is a big part of why the various PIE descendant languages and mythologies, while sharing many similarities have clearly evolved away from each other in both substance and form. Vedic India and Norse Scandinavia do look and feel pretty different, right? I find these differences to be just as interesting as the commonalities, if not more so, since we know less about them. In the case of Vedic India, the culture that came before was, of course, the great Indus Valley Civilization, which as I mentioned spanned the rivers Indus and Sarasvati, as well as much of the adjoining foothills to the west and the northwest. Its high period of urban development, called the Harappan period, was between 2700 BC and 1800 BC, but its developmental stages stretch all the way back to at least 7000 BCE, at Mergar and elsewhere. Over 1500 of their urban sites have been found, and the population of the Indus is estimated to have been as high as 5 million. That may not seem like a lot now, but compare that to the estimated 280,000 or so for the civilizations of Sumer and Akkad. 5 million, that's, that's actually pretty huge for an ancient civilization. It's again the largest in the ancient world. In this Harappan period, the people of the Indus replicated a standardized method of city building across dozens of urban sites all throughout their territory. And whether great or small, they always followed the same template, with some degree of regional variance. And this is a completely unique feature, which is not found in any other civilization. Perhaps we can picture an ancient Harappan city planner scoffing as he lays his bricks. Not like those ramshackle, ad hoc Sumerian cities, oh no. This is going to make sense. As you can see from these pictures, their cities do almost look modern, despite being 5,000 years old. The Harappans actually invented the idea of a brick with a 2 to 1 length to width ratio, which to this day has proven to be the most efficient way to make buildings out of bricks. These Harappan cities don't just look modern either. They included standardized plumbing to the homes and beneath the city streets, which were angled very subtly downhill so as to keep the drains flowing, which is an amazing technical feat. Most street corners had public wells, which they built with specially made wedge-shaped bricks and featured public lighting, just to make things a little more pleasant. As to my favorite feature of their cities, well, it's probably a tie between their huge centralized public baths, apparently accessible to all, and the fact that they had a kind of air conditioning ventilation that they designed into the roofs of their buildings. It is India, after all. It's very hot. And by the way, we call these baths, but they probably also had something to do with religious water rights, especially in the south at places like Mahanjadaro. And as always, there's the caveat of us not being quite sure for lack of being able to read their script. 
The people of the Indus also smelted high-quality bronze, and they traded their famed carnelian beads and various other prized goods, such as lapis lazuli, to Sumer and Dilmun, and perhaps Egypt. And wherever they traded, they left their seals behind to tell the tale. The Harappans actually visited Ur and other Sumerian cities so much that they had permanent living quarters there. And Sumerian and Indus Valley art has been shown to have influenced one another. One Sumerian seal depicts a translator from Alua, which is the Sumerian name for the Indus civilization. And uh, I do believe this Sumerian gentleman is wearing a horned hat with a tree growing out of it. More on that in the next video. Finally, it seems that the ancestors of the Indus civilization probably independently invented farming at a place called Mergar in the mountains of modern-day Pakistan. And by independently, I mean independently of the Fertile Crescent in Anatolia, where farming was first developed. For example, the crops grown at Mergar came from the local area and from Southeast Asia, as opposed to the Middle East. And new genetic studies also show that the Anatolian farmer population that spread farming all over Europe and the Near East did not reach as far east as India. The domestication of the first crops suitable for agriculture is, of course, a huge topic on its own, and research is still ongoing in this field. But suffice it to say that we certainly do know that the people of the Indus civilization were very successful farmers who grew a variety of crops to feed their relatively huge population. In addition to food crops, the people of the Indus were actually the first in the world to domesticate cotton, and textiles were in general a specialty of the Indus civilization, which dedicated large facilities to weaving and storing textiles, as well as producing indigo dye. Best of all, textiles provide another significant avenue of proven cultural continuity between the Indus and later India. Distinctly Indian styles of dress, such as the sari, textiles with mandalas, and arm bangles, as well as turbans of various styles, all existed in various areas that became part of the Indus civilization and still persist to this day in those areas. I've linked to a video from Harappa.com where archaeologist Mark Knoyer gives a detailed lecture on the Indus textiles. And there are many more examples of specific styles and weaving techniques that have persisted for 5,000 years. One really could go on for hours and hours talking about the wonders of the Indus civilization. But since we don't have hours, I've left the links to my favorite sources on them in the description below, so you can check that out yourself. The bottom line here leaves us with two facts. Number one, the people of the Indus civilization were incredibly advanced and incredibly widespread. And although their urban sites were already in decline when the Indo-Aryans arrived, there is ample proof of continuity between the late stage Indus civilization and what is considered early Vedic India. For example, we find the pottery of the Vedic painted gray ware culture in several of the late Indus period cities, indicating some kind of relationship of trade and exchange. When the Vedic peoples got around to building their own cities on the Gangetic Plain around 1000 BCE, they kept the unique Indus tradition of public central baths and public wells, and they also changed the width of their horse chariots to match the already established wider wheel ruts from the ox carts of the Indus civilization. Hundreds of loan words from the native Indian languages of Munda and Dravidian can also be found in the Rig Veda, which is the oldest Vedic writing. And that, of course, only happens through extensive cultural contact. We've found lingam stones and evidence of religious water rites later associated with Parvati among the Indus sites. And of course, any kind of identification of Shiva and the peepal tree on the Harappan seals demonstrates yet more cultural continuity. Now, just as in the modern world, cities of ancient nation-states tended to be somewhat cosmopolitan, meaning culturally, if not ethnically, diverse. This is because the first civilizations arose from the coagulation of smaller regional groups, and the cities of these civilizations mostly sprang up along trade routes. Both of those factors are at play in the case of the Indus civilization, a society of prolific traders which began when several smaller regional cultures along the Indus, at least six and possibly as many as ten, began to conglomerate around 4000 BCE, in a process very similar to the formation of other river-based civilizations like Egypt and Sumer. One example of the cultural diversity of the Indus civilization can be found in the six distinct types of contemporary burials that have been found at Mohenjo-daro. Generally speaking, burial customs are unique to a given culture, and thus diversity of burial is a pretty good indicator for diversity of culture overall. As far as what language was spoken by the people of this ancient civilization, the two I just mentioned, Munda and Dravidian, 
are definitely the top two candidates for an Indus-wide language. And though that question is still up in the air, there is in general good evidence for a multiplicity of tongues being spoken in the various parts of their territory. We should also keep in mind that the Indus civilization would have exerted cultural influence over an even wider area through trade and contact. So even the other indigenous Indian cultures who then later assimilated with the Indo-Aryans would have already been influenced by Indus culture, if not the actual outflow migration of the Indus people after the de-urbanization of their society. Recent genetic studies indicate that the Indus civilization genetic makeup was a mix of an ancient Iranian hunter-gatherer population, which broke away from the main Iranian group around 10,000 BCE, and native peoples of India, who are referred to as ancient ancestral South Indians. And those would be hunter-gatherers of Austro-Asiatic descent, similar to the people of the Andaman Islands. Various other peoples from the Himalayan mountains north of India and other places in the hinterlands also filtered into the cultural stewpot, as those hinterlands Landers are wont to do. The result was a distinct Harappan genome, which had no steppe ancestry as of yet, and this genome actually went on to become the largest donor to the gene pool of not only modern-day India and Pakistan, but all of Southeast Asia. In other words, it's very important that you don't think about the people of the Indus civilization as having disappeared. They didn't. They just stopped hanging out in cities. Overall, they still would have outnumbered the Aryan tribes who migrated in. And that's reflected in the genome of modern-day India, which contains significant steppe ancestry, but skews much closer to this ancient Indus genome, with more steppe ancestry among those in the north. So that's the Aryan migration, at least the broad strokes of it. However, there's just a little bit of land between the Russian steppe and the Indian subcontinent. And the people who lived there had a role to play as well. So let's take a look at the path of the Indo-Iranians on the map, beginning with the Sintashta settlements here at the foot of the Ural Mountains. As I mentioned, the Sintashta culture represents a major step forward in steppe technology, if you'll pardon the pun. And their new chariots and horses enabled them to spread out quickly to become what's called the Andronovo Horizon, which was culturally very similar to the Sintashta. In particular, these Indo-Iranian Sintashta charioteers migrated down through what's known as the Inner Asian Mountain Corridor to reach the foothills of the Hindu Kush Mountains right on the doorstep of India. However, before they crossed into India, their language and culture was significantly influenced by the people who lived in those mountains and foothills. That civilization is known to scholars as the Oxus, or BMAC civilization. Although you can just say BMAC, because that's more fun. And they flourished in the areas of modern-day Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan. Particularly in this cozy little spot where the Oxus River, also called the Amu Darya, flows down from the mountains onto the steppe and, back then, into the Aral Sea. The high period of the Oxus civilization was between 2300 BC and 1700 BC, and they appear to have grown out of older indigenous cultures in that area. BMAC is short for Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex, a name derived from two civilizations which sprang up later in the same region, Bactria and Margiana. Now, scholars aren't quite certain about the level of political unity between their urban sites, and it should be noted that their culture spanned much more than the headlands of the Oxus River. The Oxus civilization was primarily an urban and agricultural one, but they also exerted influence over a larger area, and even included its own group of pastoral nomads who wandered the open lands between the Oxus River and the Aral Sea. As you can see on the map, you can't get to India without passing through the lands of the Oxus. And the Indo-Iranians and Indo-Aryans seem to have done a little more than just pass through. Some groups of Indo-Aryans almost certainly intermarried with the people of the Oxus. And the Indo-Iranians who went into Iran definitely did. Though genetic evidence is unclear on how much, and there is still scholarly debate happening around the issue. So far, we only have a few samples of ancient Indian DNA to work with, as DNA evidence breaks down much faster in tropical climates, of course. And while several samples of Indo-Aryans from the Swat Valley do show significant BMAC ancestry, overall the BMAC genome does not seem to have been, quote, a major contributor to today's Indian population. It's most likely the case that some groups of Indo-Aryans 
did intermarry, and some simply cohabitated without intermarrying, as there is ample evidence of still nomadic steppe peoples living right alongside the citizens of the Oxus. Pastoralists and herders often range between the plains and the foothills according to the season, and this naturally brought the people of the Andronovo into contact with the people of the Oxus. Next, we turn to language and religion. As the authoritative research of Harvard Sanskrit professor Michael Witzel has shown, the Indo-Aryans appear to have picked up over 300 loan words from the people of the Oxus on their way to India. Words relating to irrigation, agriculture and urban life, words for various mountain spirits, water spirits, and other nature spirits, words relating to the sacred Soma ritual of the Rishis, and even the word Rishi, and probably the important Soma-drinking Vedic deity Indra, who seems to be a combination of classic PIE storm god attributes and a local BMAC deity. Professor Witzel also pointed out that the standard dragon slayer myth of Proto-Indo-European cultures seems to have been influenced by the religious beliefs of the BMAC. Typically, the slaying of the dragon leads to the release of either cows or women, which, as you'll notice, are the two things the steppe peoples love to steal from one another. But the later Indian and Iranian myths of slaying world-encircling chaos dragons like Varitra now release bound-up waters instead. And this is an idea that apparently stems from the fact that all the rivers in that area flow from glacial meltwater in the Himalayas and Hindu Kush mountains. This reality is evident in lines such as these, from the Rig Veda Mantra 1, Hymn 32, and this is verse 1 and 2. Now I shall proclaim the heroic deeds of Indra, those foremost deeds that the mace wielder performed. He smashed the serpent. He bored out the waters. He split the bellies of the mountains. He smashed the serpent resting on the mountain. For him, Tavastar had fashioned the resounding sun-like mace. Like bellowing milk cows streaming out, the waters went straight down to the sea. The Norse chaos serpent Jormungandr lives in the ocean, of course, as do most chaos dragons. But here you can see that the serpent instead lives up on the mountain, and that slaying the serpent and splitting open the mountain are part of the same act which releases the torrential floodwaters that run down to the sea. That's the glacial meltwater, melted by the sun, note Indra's sun-like mace, and running down to the sea, a terrific mythical description of the Oxus River running down to the Aral Sea, or the Indus and other rivers running down from the Himalayas to the Indian Plain and then to the Indian Ocean. You can also see the echo of the older PIE myth, where slaying the dragon releases the cows. Here, the streaming out of the bound-up waters are simply compared to bellowing milk cows. Along the same lines, the famous Nagas, which are basically ubiquitous in Southeast Asian mythology, also originated in the lands of the BMAC. And originally, they too were associated with ice and snow and restricting or carrying the waters. Another interesting loan word that the Indo-Aryans picked up from the BMAC is the word bij or bija, which means both seed and semen. That's the same word in rakta bija, the blood seed, whom we discussed in the Kali video. There's also a prominent goddess of waters and fertility found throughout the Bimak culture, and she is thought to have perhaps influenced the character of the Avestan river goddess Anahita and the Vedic river goddess Sarasvati. Even the famous namaste greeting may have origins in the BMAC, according to scholarly analysis of these statues. David Anthony, author of the seminal Proto-Indo-European work The Horse, The Wheel, and Language, believes that the Vedic Aryan religion itself probably arose during the time the Indo-Aryans spent in the Hindu Kush mountains, going so far as to call it a syncretic mixture of old Central Asian and new Indo-European elements. And that's consistent with the prominence of Indra and Soma in the Rig Veda. 250 of its hymns are actually dedicated to Indra, in fact. So, once again, we find ourselves at the confluence of fascinating history and another reason why the Aryan invasion theory is wrong. Specifically, the idea that genetic Europeans rode into India and gave it its culture hits some pretty major rocks here. That say the Hindu Kush mountains are pretty major rocks joke. No, but seriously, you can see that the Aryan culture was already evolving quite significantly before it reached India. So scholars such as Witzel and Anthony and others tend to think that, in general, there was a major Indo-Iranian and Indo-Aryan cultural evolution, if you will, in the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Not sure if the Soma had anything to do with that. <laughs>
Based on findings in the grave sites of the Oxus civilization, we know that the Indo-Iranians and Indo-Aryans began filtering into the Oxus around 2100 BCE, and were definitely coming through in greater numbers by 1700 BCE, which leaves several centuries before they would have reached India, time in which the two cultures would have mingled, added to each other's vocabularies, maybe sat around the campfire drinking a little soma, and probably intermarried a little bit. There may, of course, have been some level of local conflict as well, but once again, we just don't find any archaeological evidence of any kind of widespread armed conquest. One other thing to note, when I talk about loan words and exchanging words, I'm only talking about language here, not any sort of written script. The Oxus peoples only had a very primitive pictographic script, somewhat comparable to early Harappan script. So I'm only talking about spoken language exchange between the Oxus and the steppe peoples, who spoke a form of proto-Sanskrit, which had probably been evolving since the Sintashta days. What's interesting to learn is that sometime after hitting these mountains of Central Asia, the Indo-Aryans and Indo-Iranians basically split and went three different directions. And the current state of their very similar spoken languages basically gets snapshotted each time they reach a place with writing or develop a system of writing to write their ideas down. So first, sometime around approximately 1600 BCE, a group of Indo-Aryans streaks off to the west, somewhat mysteriously, and becomes the Mitanni people of northern Iraq and Syria. Their language is very, very close to Indian Vedic Sanskrit, and it gets written down in cuneiform when the Mitanni set up shop in the Middle East. They worshipped Vedic gods, called themselves by Vedic names and titles, and they even brought Indra with them. So it seems that some amount of bimakasization, if you will, had already happened by this point. Now, if we could ever recover the royal libraries of the Mitanni, then we'd have a great clue about the state of development of the Indo-Aryan culture right when they hit India. As the Mitanni language and culture really would be like a snapshot or time capsule of where the Indo-Aryans were in their cultural development right before they entered India. Sadly, we have yet to find their fabled capital city, Wakushani. But if we ever do find it, we'll know how to read the Mitanni records because we know how to read cuneiform. All right, so next, a few groups of Indo-Aryans move into the mountains to the east of the Oxus and north of India, where the language mutates into what's known as Nuristani. And there are even a few surviving peoples who speak this dialect in those same mountains today. Shortly thereafter, as early as 1400 BCE and not later than about 1200 BCE, Indo-Aryans enter northwest India and immediately encounter the people of the mostly de-urbanized Indus civilization, where they mingle in towns and in the country. It's hard to say exactly when the Vedas are set to writing. Beginning by approximately 1000 BCE at the latest, the Vedas are coalescing, let's say, into their canonical form in Kuru, one of the early Vedic kingdoms, and by 500 BCE, they're being written down in Proto-Brahmi script. As to when the Vedas were composed, scholars think the Rig Veda, which is the oldest of the Vedas, may be as old as 1500 BCE, but not younger than 1000 BCE, with the other three major Vedas coming sometime shortly after. As I mentioned earlier, the Rig Veda describes animals and scenes that are consistent with the northern steppe, but also incorporates elements and vocabulary from two languages which were already in India, Dravidian and Munda. As you'll notice, the time window given for the Rig Veda's composition spans this period when the Indo-Aryans were in the Hindu Kush mountains, and scholars have identified clues that a lot of it was probably also composed there which, of course, lines up with David Anthony's assessment of the Vedic Aryan religion being a syncretization of BMAC ideas and steppe people ideas. Finally, we come to the Indo-Iranians, who lingered longer in the mountains. In fact, beginning around 1500 BCE, they actually set up something called the Yaz culture, building on top of older BMAC sites in the east of that civilization's former territory. This longer mingling in the lands of the BMAC led to a much more significant BMAC contribution to the modern Iranian genome, as one might expect. The Yaz culture is thought to be the place where the proto-Sanskrit language of the Indo-Iranians developed into what is called Zend, or Old Avestan, though an Avestan alphabetic script to record this language didn't come until much later, around the 3rd or 4th century CE. These mountains will later be remembered in some sources as the homeland of Zarathustra, also known as Zoroaster, whose sayings are thought to be the foundation of the Zend Avesta, the holy book of the Zoroastrian religion. Now, we have basically no way to know how accurate the legends of Zarathustra are, but it would make sense to me if the actual recent homeland of the Indo-Iranians was in a sense 
recorded in the legend of one of their founding fathers, actually the founding father. This would actually be somewhat parallel to the story of the biblical Abraham moving from the Babylonian city of Ur to the Levant, and then later becoming the founding father of the Hebrew people. Like Zarathustra, we have no way to know if Abraham was a real historical individual. However, the Hebrews were pastoral Canaanites, and the Canaanites do indeed trace their roots to the foothills of the Zagros Mountains of Iran, just on the other side of the Tigris-Euphrates River Delta, where they first practiced pastoralism. Genesis is actually full of stuff like this, which I plan to explore in future videos. Make sure you click that like and subscribe button. Finally, trade is, of course, another important avenue of cultural influence and should be mentioned here. Material evidence from Oxus grave sites shows that the southward migration of the Indo-Iranians and Indo-Aryans to the lands of the Oxus was itself preceded by years of trade between the two peoples. That's right, the horse nomads didn't just wander into the Hindu Kush mountains randomly. Instead, they migrated to a place that they already had cultural contact with. We also know that before the steppe peoples ever arrived in the mountains, the people of the Oxus had an ongoing relationship of trade and cultural exchange and occasional marriage with the Indus civilization. And both the Oxus and Indus civilizations traded with the ancient kingdoms of Iran and Mesopotamia and elsewhere. Not to mention the peoples up in the Hindu Kush mountains, where the best soma plants grow, according to the Rig Veda. So, in other words, even the Oxus influence on the Indo-Aryans may have already been flavored with the culture of India and elsewhere. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that although the Rig Veda clearly reflects a proto-Indo-European pantheon and contains many clues that large parts of it were composed on the steppe and four steppe to the north and preserved through a culture of strict, oral tradition. It also incorporated many ideas, beliefs, and perhaps even deities of the people of the mountains on the way to India and the people who are already living in India. This seems like common sense, of course. Cultures always rub off on one another when they have contact, and we have ample evidence of both cultural mixing in the Hindu Kush mountains and of some level of cultural continuity between the very late Harappan period and the early Vedic tribes. Although I want to be clear, Vedic India is not a continuation of the Indus civilization. It's just that there are some amount of links and some things that pass down from one to the other. How not, right? I mean, the Indus civilization was incredibly advanced and long-lasting, and would have already left its mark on everyone living in India at that time. So, even though it was in its late stages of decline, or de-urbanization, when the Indo-Aryans arrived, of course it should be expected that Vedic culture would include some of their concepts, beliefs, and practices. Similarly, the Oxus civilization was wealthy and influential, and the Indo-Aryans seem to have spent several centuries there before reaching India. So, of course there's going to be cultural influence. Thus, both common sense and hard evidence show that the idea of genetic Europeans riding into India and giving India its culture is a gross oversimplification to the point of being factually incorrect. But as I mentioned, some people are still making this claim to this very day, on this very YouTube even. I know, I know. That's part of why I decided to address all this directly before getting into the rest of what I want to talk about in this series. Those of you researching ancient cultures and especially proto-Indo-European stuff on the internet know that there's a lot of people out there saying a lot of things. And I think it's important to both get the history right before we go any further, as well as to understand the more extremist voices that can cloud the conversation, if you will. Speaking of which, it must also be said that there are specific groups inside of India who want to deny that there was ever any migration of steppe people into India at all, proposing instead that the commonalities in language and mythology between India and the rest of the proto-Indo-European cultures from Asia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and the Mediterranean originated in India and spread outward from there, with the genetic commonalities perhaps having some unknown, far more ancient origin. This is called Out of India Theory, or OIT, and there's no scientific evidence for it whatsoever. And in fact, it's been specifically debunked from several angles. In particular, I'll refer you to two linked videos below from World of Antiquity, which specifically takes on the out of India theory. And this isn't a European scholars thing either. Mainstream Indian scholars and geneticists also reject out of India theory and acknowledge the facts of the Indo-Aryan migration. The plain facts are that this theory was designed by people with a nationalist agenda, and it simply doesn't hold up to scholarship. It's also based on kind of a curious notion of 
what counts as Indian. Indo-Aryan peoples arrived in India 3,200 years ago, but somehow that doesn't count. What about the Iranian farmers who came to India 9,000 years before that and became part of the Indus Valley civilization? Is that okay, or is that still too foreign? How many generations of intermarriage must occur before somebody can be said to be from somewhere and no longer an interloper? As you can see, this entire idea is premised on the fantasy of a culturally pure India, which is undefiled by outsiders. And that's just not something that could ever be possible in a place that has been a crossroads for humanity ever since Homo sapiens started migrating out of Africa some 60 to 80,000 years ago. Everyone is an immigrant if you go back far enough because people don't grow out of the ground, of course. Now, with all that said, I hope you can understand why some people in India might gravitate towards a theory that attempts to reclaim Indian history from European colonialists and race supremacists, right? That's actually a little bit of what I hope to do with this series of videos about Harappan seals and Indian history. Though, of course, I'll be attempting to do so with responsible scholarship and just a little bit of responsible speculation, but not, of course, a denial of the Indo-Aryan migration, which definitely happened. I also want to add that not everyone who supports or entertains some version of out-of-India theory is an Indian nationalist, and actually not all political Indian nationalists support out-of-India theory. I genuinely do think that people are attracted to out-of-India theory for understandable reasons, and I think the people who aren't from India do need to remember that, to put it bluntly, it really sucks to have Hitler appropriate your symbols or to have colonial Great Britain show up at your doorstep to make you the next colony. Nevertheless, the facts are what they are, and the truth is, of course, much more complex than any politicized version of history would try to convince you of. Indian culture, like every other culture of the modern and ancient world, did not develop in isolation. But it is very old and very rich, and the strength of its ideas are testified to by its persistence, evolution, and influence. Proto-Indo-European language and culture may not have come out of India, but of course a lot of other knowledge and scientific breakthroughs did. And going further, we can observe that our modern world has arisen from the mingling of concepts, ideas, and inventions from every part of the world. Nobody living now laid a single brick of these ancient civilizations, but everyone living now lives in a world shaped by them. And thus, we can all benefit from learning about them. As my Indian-born Canadian friend recently said to me, racism is kind of like a mirage on the horizon. The closer you get to it, the premise for it simply disappears. So to sum up, Indian culture and mythology are amazing, and I'm here to celebrate them, and to explore some of the more esoteric corners of its mythology. What we're going to do in this series will be a great example of the sort of cultural assimilation that we just talked about. We're going to see how the sacred world tree of Vedic myth and its modern descendants of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism incorporates both PIE ideas, having many things in common with the cosmic world tree of Norse mythology, for example, Yggdrasil, as well as the ideas of the Indus civilization. The latter is a bit more speculative, of course, but that's why I'm making these videos. And as I mentioned, the Ashvata tree has already been identified on tons of Harappan seals and pottery. And I believe that closer examination of a few of those seals will strengthen the hypothesis, still a hypothesis, that there is some sort of proto-Shiva and yogic meditation being depicted on the Harappan seals, and that they were already linking the Pipal tree to meditation. So thanks for watching everyone, and make sure you click that subscribe button on the way out so you don't miss our next video, where I'll try to interpret the symbolism of the Harappan seals. I said Harappan seals, not Rappan seals. Nobody could interpret Rappan seals. We don't even speak seal, and we wouldn't know the seal rap lingo even if we did.